know, we've been around over 150 years now. If you look in our rail yard today, you look across our network today, you'll see technology in every curve, every corner. We're very well positioned to support America as it continues to grow. You look around the United States today and, and you see a large need for investment in highway construction. Most of the road systems are under distress. Um, we have a very, very solid network that can provide a very strong service product in the freight transportation marketplace and it's one that doesn't cost the taxpayers. We invest our own private equity, private capital into that. You know, we've been investing in excess of three billion dollars in capital over the last several years and we don't see any reason not to continue to make that investment. We still support a lot of very old electronics in the field that talk very specialized protocols, their communication method. And as we've been adopting the internet, internet protocol across the railroad, we wanted something that would let us take advantage of that old technology but kind of bring it forward. And so we created this IPX1000 to basically wrap that protocol or isolate that protocol and be able to run it over the internet. This is stuff that we designed because we have a core capability of electrical engineering and software engineering and the ability to design this kind of equipment and then we had it manufactured through third-party manufacturers to our specification. Those are RFID, uh, RFID readers and so on every rail car on the side of the rail car we have a small RFID tag and so as it goes by that illuminates that tag and reads information off that car, typically a car initial and number. When we drop a car off at an industry a lot of times we'll have an, a an RFID reader, we call them an AEI, Automated Equipment Identification Reader. We'll have one of those there and when, once we go into a plant we go by that reader we'll automatically mark it. That's the delivery time. Well that's important because we have obligations to our customers. Sometimes there are um, financial ramifications. If we put a car at a customer's location, a clock starts for how long they have maybe to right. unload that car and then return that car. We'll bring a coal train through here, pull it through here at between three and five miles an hour. And what we have in here is we have a bunch of technology, basically sonograms, assessing the wheel looking at the wheel as it rolls through, we'll, we'll um, pump water onto the wheel to provide a conductor for the sonar, for the sound wave, and we'll actually analyze the wheel looking for internal defects. Over the last four years or so, we've processed in excess of a million wheels through here. We found a little over 125 defective wheels. The probability is very high that a number of those wheels that had those internal defects would have had a catastrophic failure potentially leading to a derailment. So what we're really doing is eliminating that risk by analyzing these wheels with this advanced technology. We uh, change the wheels that are found to have uh, defects in them. So we take it and uh, put the jack in, which weighs 5,800 pounds. We use the combi lift, jack the cars up, uh, drop the wheel that's uh, got the bad wheel impact on it. Uh, take it out, put the new wheel in. It used to be a lot different process to change out the wheels on the trains, and it was about 11 day process to do it. Now it's a 15 minute process. We just started this about four or five years ago, and it's eliminated uh, having to set those cars out. On this uh, locomotive, it uh, takes approximately 4,900 gallons of fuel. Uh, it takes about 420 gallons of uh, oil. It holds uh, about 380 gallons of water. Uh, most of the locomotives on here are around the 4,400 horsepower. Your loaded trains um, on, with coal are more fuel efficient than your empty trains. Hmm. The empties will generally burn on a 250 mile run, generally burn 9 to 1,200 gallons depending on wind and your loaded trains can actually make it you know 200 miles or 250 miles in as little as 400 gallons because once you get that weight that 20,000 tons rolling it's basically you're just you know doing more floating and braking one of these screens if you're a distributed power train with power on the rear end you set up the screen to anything you do with the control here is going to also synchronize back with your distributed power unit could be two miles away from you and it's going to uh, take the take the prompts that you're doing with this throttle back on that locomotive. You can also do what we call fence them. So what we'll use that for is as, as you crest a hill, 
might want to use braking power on your head end as that's as the cars start to come down and that slack comes down but you'll keep your distributed power unit shoving up that hill and then as it'll crest and you can knock that off as far as the power and have that start to go into braking so you can almost run it you know so the smoothness the fuel efficiency is much better on distributed power trains Like the original railroad kind of connected the United States, the Transcontinental Railroad, and that was really what drove the creation of the Union Pacific. When you look today, greater than 30% of our traffic originates or, des or is destined to international markets. We think today Union Pacific is well equipped to connect the United States to the rest of the world.